All right. So we're going to talk today a little bit about culinary medicine and food uh, and how food choices in our bodies make, um, make you more healthy or not. So we're going to talk first a little bit about the microbiome. And I see that several of you are eating lunch. That's good. We're going to talk about poop while you're eating. Um, and how does the microbiome relate to your food choices? Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about what you should eat and what to avoid, and then how those long-term food choices kind of correlate to overall health and longevity. So the first thing to note is that we know that the microbiome, which is really kind of the tropical rainforest that lives in your colon and on your skin and in your ears and so forth, uh, begins developing at birth. But some researchers are starting to postulate that even the uterus is not actually a sterile environment, and the development of the microbiome happens even in utero. We know that there are about 100 trillion bacteria that are living in the gut microbiome, uh, about 10 times the number of human cells in the body. There is tremendous biodiversity in the microbiome and many different species living in that tropical rainforest. But just like a rainforest, we have a really a long way to go before we understand fully how it works. The components of what is a normal microbiome are still kind of relatively unknown at this time. Um, in this study published in Cell in 2019, they were looking for definitions of normal mo body microbiome. And you can imagine how challenging this is. Uh, how can you tell you know, what is normal whenever you're looking for thousands of species, not to mention species um, ratios? So the group here used over 9,000 metagenomes from four different body sites and 32 countries to try to map it out. And projects like this have kind of uncovered thousands, literally thousands of new species of bacteria that we didn't know existed until we started looking into this area in the body. Um, some of the newly discovered species comprise about thousands of reconstructed genomes and non-westernized populations harbor a large fraction of the newly discovered species. So the science is definitely an open frontier. We also know that colonization is not in any way random. Your gut harbors the highest density recorded for any microbial habitat with over 100 trillion microbes. The gut community is dominated by two different um, divisions, the bacteroides and the firmicutes, and one member of, the, um, of another subtype. That type makes up less than 10%, so we're going to kind of gloss over that today. Here's just one example of the gut taxonomic uh, composition with about 90% of the microbiome belonging to the firmicutes and bacteroides division. You can see that there's only a very small part that does not. And the gut microbiome varies according to the intestinal anatomic regions as well, um, which vary in terms of physiology and pH and oxygen tension and digestive flow rates which are more rapid in the mouth to the cecum and then slow after you pass through that ileocecal valve. Um, it also varies by substrate availability and host secretion. So the small intestine provides a more challenging environment for microbiome colonizers given the fairly short transit times, which is about three to five hours, and the high bio, bio concentration. Whereas the large intestine, which is characterized by slow flow rates and neutral to mildly acidic pH, harbors by far the largest uh, bi microbiome uh, community, which is dom dominated by those um, anaerobic bacteria. So you can see here that we have slightly different groups of bacteria that are associated with the gut wall as well as with the, uh, versus those that are uh, in the lumen, um, which makes sense, right? If, you're, if you want to build a, a house along a river's edge, you're not going to put it right in the middle of the flow of the river. You're going to look for a nice place on the edge, and that's where we're going to have these different kinds of colonies. So within individuals, we see microbial variation, which is impacted by gestational age, type of delivery, and foods consumed early in life. Based on the colonization of the vaginal canal and the milk duct and nipple, then it makes sense that vaginal deliveries and breastfeeding promote microbial uh, biodiversity in the infant. And this is just one of the reasons why breastfeeding is important to the immune system in terms of development. It's not just about mom's you know, secretory IgA. It's also about passing on what we hope is a healthy microbiome. Not surprisingly, the microbiome changes as we age and, of course, with our diet. It does not respond really well to the napalm of antibiotics, Are you, although you can see here that some of the um, antibiotics are a little bit less napalmy than others. You have increased biodiversity with some of them. So the reason that we care about all of this is that we have a commensal relationship with the microbiome. Um, we feed the microbiome, then the microbiome makes the short-chain fatty acids that become the food for the enterocytes. So let me let that sink in for just a minute. 
your enterocytes are eating microbial waste products as food. That's where the short chain fatty acids come from. So clearly this is really a synergistic relationship. And another highlight of this slide is that the mucosal functional layer is very complex and the strength of the mucus and the concentration of the digestive enzymes within them are affected by the microbiome, which in turn affects the microbiome composition. So this is very much a two-way street. And what we feed the microbiome then becomes the food for ourselves. We'll come back to this concept in, in just a little bit. Let's touch for just a second on the enteric nervous system, which is two thin layers of about a million nerve cells lining your gut from your esophagus to your rectum. Remember that the population of the gut microbiome is about 100 trillion microorganisms. So that's 100,000 bacteria for every nerve cell in your enteric nervous system. So since most of our fecal matter is microbial die-off and, and so forth, it's no wonder that people continue to poop even when you're not feeding them and when they're NPO in the hospital, right, because all of this is fluffing off. And note that this is not then the enteric and the central nervous system connecting. There's a third brain, the microbiome, that's really highly influential on the complex signaling pathways that are here really very simplified. But you can see that this is a bidirectional relationship, and then the microbial diversity and relative abundance is also impacting the gut brain. We also know that both the enteric nervous system and the microbiome are strongly associated with mental health disruption and pathology. And there's a reason why IBS is so strongly associated, again, bidirectionally, with anxiety, depression, and other mental health disorders. When the gut microbiome is not healthy, the mind doesn't function optimally. It's, it's really just kind of that simple. So if we know that the microbiome impacts mental health and what we feed the microbiome affects macrobiotic health, then the question is what should we be eating? How should we be fertilizing the microbiome? So the answer is, of course, that you should feed your microbiome lots and lots of, every, every, of the things that your organ systems need to be healthy, right? Lots of donuts and candies and sugar and soda and alcohol and cake. Yeah? You know this. You're doctors. So... Let's take just a minute and take a look at this slide. Um, first of all, is your stomach rumbling as you're looking at this slide? Anybody? Okay. Do any of these things look like something that grew in the ground or swam in the water or flew in the sky or walked on the land? We know bacon did, but it doesn't really look like that, right? They, the first big clue that you're going down a less than ideal path in your food choices is that it doesn't look like anything that your ancestors would recognize as something palatable. And what might a food label look like for any of these items? Is it going to be full of words that you recognize from the edges of the grocery store? There's probably not any broccoli in any of this, right? Um, they're going to be full of preservatives and chemicals and you know, euphemistic words that mean sugar, not really anything that, that, um, that's recognizable as a non-chemical kind of English typical word. Are there any gardeners out there? Anybody with a garden? Okay. So what happens if you put this kind of food into your gardening soil? The parasites are going to be all over this. The yeasts are going to love it. But are you really fertilizing your soil in a way that is helpful in any way for growing healthy bacteria? So when you think about what you're doing to your gut, uh, your microbiome, and your brain, when you put this combination of chemicals and sugar into your body, it's not so bueno, right? I'm not trying to call anybody out or make anybody feel bad. I just want you to think about the things that go in your mouth as fertilizer for what's happening in the rest of your body. So this doesn't really... Um, when, you, when you get a big sugar rush like this, um, you do get a happy little sugar rush, right? But is that sugar rush actually coming from you or is that coming from the stimulation of the microbiome that then is fostering a little serotonin and dopamine rush on the enteric nervous system that makes you feel good? So it's really more about that. And you can get those same rushes from broccoli if you just start changing your diet and avoid the doctor's lounge. Um, so before we move on, now that I've given you this information and I'm seeing all these heads like go down in the audience, I really am not trying to donut shame you. I just, <laughs> um, but think about now, does this still look as appealing as it did a couple of minutes ago when we started talking about it? 
right? So your, your gut really is very closely linked to your brain. So the answer to the question of what you should eat is exactly what you expect it to be. You guys know that vegetables are good for you, right? And fruit is good for you, yes. So I'm not gonna spend any time on fruits and vegetables because you already know that those are good things. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about why those are good things. The first component of diet that you might not be aware of is fiber. So fiber is found in vegetables, in legumes, which is all kinds of beans, whole grains, and fruits as well. Oops. One of the reasons fiber is so important is because it feeds the microbiome. Uh, you may have seen the word prebiotic in some of the literature, uh, either in the lay literature or you know, on, on some of the medical websites. Prebiotics are the things that feed the probiotic bacteria of the microbiome. So they include vegetables, like I was just saying, lots of greens, and then things that you have to chew, garlic, onions, leeks. When you eat those things, they've, they've got a lot of fiber in them, asparagus. When you chew on that, it's got a lot of fiber. But your small gut doesn't um, digest those things, and they go then into the large gut, into the, the large intestine, where they start uh, being broken down by the microbiome. Roots, the same sort of thing. Jicama, chicory, burdock, all that sort of thing. Grains, one of the reasons that whole grains are so, um, are on all of your food labels is because those whole grain particles don't get digested in the small intestine. Again, they, they are, become prebiotics for the gut microbiome. And then fruits like banana and apples are another key component. If you wanna get more sciencey about it, beta-glucans, fructo-oligosaccharides, galacto-oligosaccharides, and inulin. Inulin in particular is what you'll see in a lot of the nutraceuticals that your patients are taking um, to, that are in combination or alone with uh, probiotics. So one of the other things that I love about fiber is that protein is such a big hot topic right now in the literature, right? Everybody needs to eat more protein and we're all worried about getting enough protein on our diet, yada, yada, yada. Legumes, so beans, plus whole grains give you a complete protein. So you don't have to eat animal products in order to get a lot of protein in your diet. You don't even have to eat things that are kind of pseudo um, protein that we think about tofu and, and that sort of thing. But the reason that tofu has a lot of um, protein in it is because it's coming from a soy bean, a legume. All right. So when we think about diets that are kind of more traditional, when we think about a Hispanic diet and we think about rice and beans, or we think about an Indonesian diet, or we think about a Chinese diet, all of those diets have lots and lots of combinations of rice or other sorts of whole grains in combination with legumes of some sort. So that might be chickpeas if you're talking about Moroccan food, uh, soybeans if you're talking about Chinese food. So the combination of those makes a whole protein. The next thing, that is really important to put into your diet is fermented foods. And fermented foods are those probiotics. So we just talked about fiber, which is the prebiotic, and this is now the probiotic component. Um, dairy and dairy substitutes uh, in the form of yogurt and kefir. Kefir in particular um, is one of those foods that's maybe a little bit tricky to get people to eat. Um, but it's sort of a liquidy form of yogurt. So I tell people to kind of put it in a smoothie or, or drink it in, their, um, in a, a cup of hot tea or something like that in the morning. Use it either as a creamer or as a yogurt. Um, it's also 100, it's 99% lactose-free. So for people that are lactose intolerant, this is a great way to get some vitamin D into their system without aggravating their lactose intolerance. Um, when you look for fermented foods, you wanna choose labels that say live active cultures on them. So not all yogurt actually has active probiotics in them. Um, most pickles on the shelf also, for example, are not uh, fermented in any way. They're preserved in vinegar. Um, but you want to look for things that have little bubbles in them because those microbiome components, those bacteria, make the same kind of bubbles whenever they get into your colon. That's what, that's what gives you gas. Um, and then kombucha is a really good substitute for people that like carbonated beverages. So when people are talking about, you know, I really like my, my diet Pepsi or whatever, this is a good alternative that's actually good for you and has that same kind of good carbonated uh, mouthfeel. Um, you are all probably familiar with sauerkraut. It really can be helpful not just, you know, on top of a hot dog at Portillo's, but also on top of any other kind of sandwich. It gives a little bit of a zing to a salad, or you can put it on top of a soup or a stew. 
et cetera. And then kimchi is kind of similar. People sometimes struggle with how spicy it is. Um, but if you make it at home, and there's about a thousand recipes online for making chim kimchi at home, you can kind of control the spice. So the reason, the other reason I'm telling you all of this is so that you can also be passing on some of this information to your patients. So we have our probiotics, we have our prebiotics. Let's talk a little bit more about gut integrity. Um, if we pick diets that are high in fiber and probiotic foods, the mucus strength for the, uh, around the edges of the gut lumen is high, and the healthy bacteria are supporting that lumen rather than disrupting it. If we don't feed the microbiome fiber, the mucus strength wanes, and irritant bacteria begin to kind of penetrate that mucus layer. So in this experiment, mice were fed a Western-style diet, which is high in saturated fat and sugar and low in fiber, McDonald's basically, um, and that led to more and more penetration of the mucus layer you can see there on the, on the side. Um, from the study, a healthy intercolonic mucous membrane layer expands towards the intestinal lumen at a speed of about two micrometers per minute. So it's not an insignificant speed. That's the mucus growth rate. And it actively pushes the growth, the gut microbiome away from the epithelial surface, kind of protecting that, um, those enterocytes. But in mice fed a Western diet, this growth rate decreased by a factor of four to 0 0.5 micrometers per minute, a defect that could be prevented with a fecal transplant from mice that had been fed a healthy diet. So it definitely has to do with, uh, with the microbiome. In specific, they were looking at bifidobactam longum in terms of species. So these diet-mediated alterations of the microbiome lead to defects of the mucus layer that are likely caused by a combination of host and microbial factors, which then lead to the penetration of LPS into the circulation. And this is kind of that concept of leaky gut. So you hear a lot about this right now. This is where this is coming from, and there is some scientific data to back that up. Um, the way that it's being used right now in terms of checking for uh, serum IgG um, stimulation or, or you know, components against carrots and almonds and so forth, I'm not so convinced of. If somebody comes in to me, especially that's already had those, those kinds of tests done, I'm more looking to say, okay, we need to fix your intestinal permeability. We don't need to take you off of carrots and almonds and, and broccoli, right? It's more of a microbiome problem and a, and a problem with the mucus layer not being intact than it is developing allergies and food sensitivities to all sorts of foods. Um, and so knowing that fiber and fermented foods are important, the next question is which dietary patterns uh, have those kinds of components? So rather than going down the rabbit hole of discussing every single one of these, the things that have a lot of probiotic and prebiotic components are in the left-hand category. You're, I'm sure, all familiar with the Mediterranean diet. Subtypes of those are the anti-inflammatory diet and the MIND diet. Asian diets in general, Japanese food, Korean food, uh, Chinese food, and so forth, are all rich in uh, both prebiotic and probiotic components. And then vegetarian, vegan, and plant-forward diets. Although, you know, there's no uh, meat in vegetarian macaroni and cheese or Oreos, so you do have to ask your patients what they're actually eating. Um, you can eat a vegetarian diet and it still be a pretty crappy diet. Things that are sort of in the maybe category, um, the paleo diet and Whole30 is good in terms of fresh fruits and vegetables, but it prohibits legumes and grains and dairy. So the no dairy, I can kind of get behind that. I think you can get vitamin D from other sources and calcium from other sources. But the legumes and grains, I just don't see, I don't see any scientific literature that says, yes, it's bad to eat legumes and grains. Um, similarly, the paleo diet prohibits anything cultivated, so I just really don't think that that's healthy and sustainable for most people. Um, we put people in the hospital for ketosis. You all put people in the hospital for ketosis. So again, the, some of the literature is showing that it's very helpful for um, for children with epilepsy, and because of that high fat component, yes, I can, I can understand that. The, the literature makes sense. But there's a lot of incidental case reports about rapid weight loss, which, again, I, is just not sustainable. That's what leads to yo-yoing in terms of diet. And so if somebody is, um, is a child and has epilepsy, then yes, okay, keto. But for most humans, I, I just don't think it's a very good choice. Um, intermittent fasting, there's a lot of data that's growing behind intermittent fasting. Um, certainly something with a 12-hour fast from 7 o'clock at night until 7 o'clock in the morning is doable for most people, and the health benefits are very clear. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, specifically, the diet or the process of digesting food is really highly metabolic, 
and you have to make a lot of enzymes and undergo a lot of fluid shifts and uh, contract a lot of smooth muscle, which uses ATP and other resources in order to digest your food. And your body has to be kind of reactionary when you feed it. We're, we're not cows. You know, we can't just have our cud sitting there in our stomach for hours and hours and hours. It has to go downstream. And so it, we can't just leave it, you know, sitting there. The food in the gut has to be dealt with. So when we eat, the gut has to take resources away from other parts of the body, like wound healing and clearing out debris and metabolic byproducts and plumping up your skin and so forth whenever you're eating something. So if, you're, if people are grazing constantly over the course of the day, those digestive enzymes are constantly getting stimulated to be made, and your body has to pick its resources, has to pick its battles. And so it goes away from all of these other sort of metabolic repair mechanisms that, that are otherwise important. So if you think about, you know, when you're sick and your appetite just kind of shuts down, this is the way your body handles emergency situations. And it's pumping all of its resources into dealing with that pathogenic invasion. The reverse is also true on smaller scales. So if you eat constantly, it doesn't ever get to focus completely on healing or cleaning or plumping or tidying or whatever. It's always in food mode. So what I like about intermittent fasting is that it helps to slow all of that down for a while. It gives your body to do other things. Um, my main concern about putting this completely in the left-handed column is, of course, anybody with blood sugar issues, which there are a lot of people with that uh, these days, and tiny little people with very little body fat and, and that kind of thing. They, they shouldn't be doing long-term intermittent fasting, and certainly not the more you know, 16 hours of fast and eight hours of eating kinds of situations. Um, and then things that are on the right-hand side is the standard American diet, the Western diet, lots of fast food and processed and sugars and artificial sweeteners. Um, and, you know, that doesn't – I drive back and forth to Chicago multiple times a month. That doesn't mean that I don't ever get something at a fast food restaurant. But what that means is I'm much more likely to go for a Wendy's taco salad, which has lots of beans and lettuce and, and vegetables in it, than I am to go for a Wendy's hamburger. Um, if I'm craving a hamburger, then I usually ask for like a lettuce wrap kind of thing to try to cut back on that. So I'm by no means perfect, um, but I do think that trying to think about the choices that you're making is, is an important component. So just a few little comments about the Mediterranean diet. It's based on the dietary habits of people from Italy and Greece, like your esteemed chief resident here. Um, the majority of the diet consists of vegetables and fruits and grains and beans and herbs and nuts and seafood and olive oil. Um, poultry, cheese, and eggs and red wine are consumed in moderation. You can usually get people to be a little bit softer when you're having dietary conversations with them about saying, like, hey, this one allows you to drink a little bit. Um, it does avoid, for the most part, red meat and refined grains, which means, like, Uncle Ben's rice as opposed to whole grains rice. Uh, processed foods and sugar in especially in sweetened beverages. So this slide I would encourage you guys to take a picture of because this is the argument for eating the Mediterranean diet. Greater association or greater adherence to the, Medi the Mediterranean diet is associated with an almost 10% reduction in overall mortality, a 9% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, a 6% reduction in cancer mortality, and a 13% reduction from Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases. And specifically in terms of cancer, what it does is reduces oxidative and inflammatory processes of cells. It decreases DNA damage and cell proliferation and survival of cancer cells, and it reduces angiogenic capacity of neoplastic cells. This is just by eating more whole grains and avoiding red meat and processed foods. So this is a really strong argument for doing this. And this, this diet is very, very sustainable. It's beautiful. The foods that are in this diet are lovely to look at, and they're so flavorful and exciting to eat. So this is, it's, it's easy, and it's very, very significantly helpful for your health. Another way of looking at it is that consuming a diet high in vegetables and low in processed fats and sugars minimize or prevents cardiometabolic disease, prevents you from being immunocompromised, and promotes your longevity. It decreases risk of dementia, mood disorders, and all-cause mortality. So pretty strong literature. Um, we expect food to kind of impact cardiovascular disease and diabetes risk. We've all kind of come to think about those two things as being associated. But what about mental health? 
the cross-sectional and longitudinal data demonstrate significant relationships between unhealthy eating patterns and depression and anxiety. So how many of you guys see patients that are depressed and anxious? This is something they can do. None of them like the meds, right? Nobody likes to be on antidepressants. They all have nasty side effects. Nobody likes to be on anxiolytics. They all have nasty side effects. Tell them to eat better food. The Mediterranean diet has strong literature backing treatment for affective disorders, particularly depression. In the PREDIMED study, which is a three-year randomized control trial set up initially to evaluate dietary adherence for risk of cardiovascular disease, they demonstrated that eating a Mediterranean diet with supplementation of nuts was protective against depression, particularly in patients with diabetes. Higher levels of saturated fats and added sugars, that's what SFAS stands for there on the right-hand side, um, were consistently associated with higher anxiety levels in the Attica study, which evaluated 1,128 Greek people over 50 years for their dietary habits, energy intake, and anxiety symptoms. So those anxiety levels correlated to higher saturated fats and sugars and were lower in Mediterranean diet patterns, independent of exercise, comorbid depression, or cognitive distortion levels. All right, let's talk a little bit more about intermittent fasting. There are multiple different ways to, to define intermittent fasting. The first one is this time-restricted eating, which restricts the number of hours you eat in a day. The other is this business of periodic fasting, where you eat for five days and then you fast for two, or you alternate one-to-one, -one where you eat and don't eat. So the weight loss does occur because they're, you're often consuming less calories overall, but there's not really any long-term studies performed to date to really talk about some of those specifics of weight loss. So in this slide, though, you can see that total energy intake, diet composition, and length of fasting between meals contribute to oscillations in the ratios of the level of bioenergetic sensors like nicotinamide, ATP, and acetyl-CoA. These intermittent energy carriers activate downstream proteins that regulate cell function and stress resistance. So intermittent fasting triggers neuroendocrine responses and adaptations characterized by low levels of amino acids, glucose, and insulin. And during fast fasting, um, AMPK is activated, which triggers repair and inhibition of anabolic processes. Acetyl-CoA and NADH positive serve as cofactors for epigenetic uh, modifiers, which in turn result in the expression of genes involved in stress resistance and mitochondrial biogenesis. So overall, the organism responds to intermittent fasting by minimizing anabolic processes, like synthesis and growth and reproduction, favoring maintenance and repair systems, enhancing stress resistance, recycling damaged molecules, stimulating mitochondrial biogenesis, and supporting self-survival. So all of these support improvements in terms of health and disease resistance. Furthermore, energy restriction for 10 to 14 hours results in depletion of liver glycogen stores and hydrolysis of triglycerides to free fatty acids in adipocytes. And free fatty acids are released into circulation, transported to nerve cells, and then produce ketone bodies, which is the whole point of the ketone diet, right? Um, they also activate the transcription factors, resulting in the production of fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor, which is a protein with widespread effects on cells throughout the body and the brain. Other ketone bodies are transported into cells where they can be metabolized into acetyl-CoA, which generates ATP. And the same beta-hydroxybutyrate ketone bodies activate transcription factors, which stimulate the expression of, of brain-derived uh, neurotrophic factor in neurons. So here's similar information kind of presented in chart form, periods of dietary restriction sufficient to cause depletion of liver glycogen stores trigger a metabolic switch toward the use of fatty acids and ketones. And cells and organ systems adapt to this bioenergetic challenge by activating signaling pathways that bolster mitochondrial function, stress resistance, and antioxidant defenses while upregulating autophagy to remove damaged uh, molecules and recycle their components. So during a period of energy restriction, cells adopt stress resistance mode through reduction in insulin signaling and overall protein synthesis. So exercise even enhances the effects of these fasting states. On recovering from fasting, so like eating and sleeping, glucose levels increase, ketone levels plummet, and cells decrease protein synthesis, undergoing growth and repair. Maintenance of an intermittent fasting regimen, particularly when combined with regular exercise, results in many long-term adaptations that improve mental and physical performance and increase disease resistance. So this is kind of my main argument for why would you ever put anybody on a ketogenic diet when intermittent fasting is so much easier to follow, allows you to go out to eat, 
and is not so restrictive and doesn't have all those other side effects and you can eat fruits and vegetables. So this, this makes a lot more sense to me rather than putting somebody into ketosis. In a couple of small scale studies, again, this is just kind of coming into the literature, um, a randomized control trials of 22 men using time restricted feeding for 28 days. They had reductions in body fat, blood pressure, um, adiponectin and HDLC. There were no changes in calorie intake. They just restricted the number of hours in the day when they were consuming the same amount of calories. So just by restricting the time that you're eating, there were changes in the cardiometabolic markers, even though there were no changes in weight. Pardon me. And then in an observational study over the course of a year, 250 people had free choice of three plans. So they weren't randomized controlled. They, were, they said, here are your three choices. And 54% of them chose intermittent fasting. 27% chose Mediterranean, and 18% chose paleo. Um, the dietary adherence to any of them declined rapidly without intensive support, but there was small weight loss, decreases in blood pressure, and decreases in hemoglobin A1C. The between group um, changes were not really substantial. So it was mostly about, do I have a group that I have some support with, and, and I'm eating a, a pretty sustainable, healthy eating pattern, and am I able to sort of change some of the cardiometabolic profiles and, and lose a little bit of weight? All right, so how are we doing as a society about reaching these goals? Not surprising that we are not doing well. We are squishy people that don't move enough and eat bad food. Um, so here's a bar graph indicating the percentage of the US population ages one year and older with intakes below the recommendation or above the limit for different food groups and dietary components. So on this graph, orange is bad and blue is good. And what we see here is that the only categories of whole grains and proteins that 50% of the population are getting, um, or sorry, that only 50% of the population are getting adequate intake in whole grains and protein foods, only half. And that's the best we can do. Um, so. For the, for the bad orange categories of orange, sugar, and fat, woohoo! only over 75% of the population are getting adequate intake of that. <laughs> right? So we're doing really, really well here. So now let's talk a little bit about the debate on sugar versus artificial sweeteners, because usually when you start talking about added sugars, then people say, oh, well, I drink Diet Coke instead of regular Coke, so I must be doing okay. Sorry. So... There is such a thing as nutritive versus non-nutritive sweeteners. And the sugar alcohols um, are actually carbohydrates with alcohols in terms of the, the chemi chemistry sense of the word. So nutritive sweeteners provide nutrition and calories, and non-nutritive sweeteners do not provide nutrition or calories. So we have sugars and we have sugar alcohols or polyols that are sugar-free. They are supposed to be substitutes for sugars for reducing glycemic response, decreasing dental caries and lowering overall calorie intake. These occur naturally in fruits and vegetables, and there's your clue. Your ancestors would recognize these things as food, so it's good to eat them. Um, the sweetness varies between 25% to 100% as sweet as sucrose, which is table sugar. And they're incompletely absorbed, so for those of you that have IBS or you have patients that have IBS, if you put them on a low sugar diet and you try to get them off of their processed foods, a lot of that gas and bloating and diarrhea will go away. Um, the non-nutritive sweeteners are the artificial sweeteners, so aspartame and saccharin and sucralose and all that sort of thing. These are regulated as food additives as opposed to food by the FDA. They're often combined with other nutritive or non-nutritive sweeteners to better mimic the flavor and taste of sugar in your mouth, and each has an acceptable dietary intake. Unfortunately, each has an individual acceptable dietary intake. So if you're drinking a lot of diet soda and then you're also putting diet sweeteners in your coffee and you're also eating pastries and stuff like that that has a lot of artificial sweeteners in it, those things are not regulated cumulatively. Um, actually, I wanted to say one other thing. The, the reason that we started doing those using non-nutritive sweeteners began with kind of cost reduction and continued with the need for calorie reduction. And it's interesting that artificial sweeteners were actually chemicals that were being developed by another purpose until somebody in the lab accidentally got some in their mouth and tasted it and decided it was sweet. So these are accidents. Um, 
Between 1999 and 2004, more than 6,000 new products containing artificial sweeteners were launched. They even found in so many products now that people can be consuming them without knowing it. The National Household Nutritional Survey uh, estimated that as of 2004, 15% of the population is regularly using artificial sweeteners. And these non-nutritive sweeteners are also called intense sweeteners, sugar substitutes, alternative sweeteners, very low calorie sweeteners, and artificial sweeteners. Um, the ADI, the acceptable daily intake, is the amount that can be consumed over a lifetime without appreciable health risk. So here's why they're popular. Sugar provides, uh, does anybody still write TPN anymore in the hospitals? Okay, 100 years ago when I was a resident, we had to write our own TPN. So you know things like sugar and carbohydrates provide four kilocalories per gram. Um, and you can see here that the sugar alcohols all provide lower calories than sucrose, than, low, than that four calories per gram. And you can see why xylitol is really so appealing because it has half the calories, but it's 100% as sweet as table sugar with malitol a close second. And the reason that sugar alcohols provide fewer sugar, fewer calories than natural sugars is because they're not completely absorbed into the body. So for this reason, high intakes of foods containing those sugar alcohols lead to gas and diarrhea. They, they cause an osmotic gradient. Um, any foods that contain sorbitol or mannitol must also include a warning on their label that excess uh, consumption may have a laxative effect. My poor husband had this happen to him. Um, we were at Thanksgiving, and he drank some V8 that had, to, had artificial sweeteners in it, and he did not enjoy any part of Thanksgiving after that. Um, the ADA advises that intakes greater than 50 grams per day of sorbitol or greater than 20 grams per day um, of mannitol can cause diarrhea. And the presence of these sugar alcohols in food doesn't mean that you can eat unlimited quantities. They're lower in calories gram for gram, but they are not calorie free. And if eaten in large enough quantities, the calories can be comparable to sugar containing foods. Um, so you have to read the food labels for calorie and carbohydrate content. So let's look more closely at the artificial non-nutritive sweeteners and artificial sweeteners. So this is saccharin, this is the pink one. Um, I don't have time to go in depth in all of the literature so you'll just have to trust me or I'll be happy to email you the literature on this. But saccharin is a weak carcinogen. It does cause a lot of allergic reactions, especially in people that are allergic to sulfonamides. Um, it causes a lot of irritability, both mentally and also kind of physiologically in, in terms of muscle um, twitches and muscle dysfunction. It's found in sweet and low and, and all of these, this list here. It is very, very sweet. It is 200 to 700 times sweeter than sucrose but it has a little bit of a bitter aftertaste, so this is not usually people's first choice. Um, aspartame is the blue one. It's uh, metabolized, so it shouldn't be consumed by people with TKU because it can lead to toxic metabolic byproducts. It's in NutraSweet and Equal and Sugar Twin. It's a little bit less sweet uh, than saccharin. It's 160 to 220 times sweeter than sucrose. This is really interesting. There are 166 studies at the last time I looked, which is about three months ago, um, relevant to the safety of aspartame. 74 had industry funding and 92 did not. 100% of those 74 research studies that were funded by industry determined that aspartame was safe. 92% of the 92 studies that were independently funded found problems with consuming aspartame. And those problems included headaches and migraines, depression, cancer, increased hunger, and kind of this aspartame disease, which is a, a conglomeration of a lot of different things. Sucralose is the yellow one. Um, this one has uh, quite a bit of literature talking about the chlorine being carcinogenic. It causes a lot of GI and IBS kinds of issues, skin irritations, chest pain and palpitations, mental health issues that include anger, depression, anxiety, and rapid, uh, pretty violent mood swings, as well as sort of this irritation, like skin irritation, so pruritus and itchy eyes. It's used either alone or it's used with Splenda, so that's with dextrose and maldextrin. What is frustrating about this food labeling is that when it's used in cooking, the label says no calorie sweetener, but the dextrose and the maldextrin have 96 calories and 32 calories um, of carbs per cup. So the no calorie sweetness part is the sucralose part, but then it's combined with things that do have a lot of sugar in them. So it's extremely misleading for our diabetic patients that are trying to control their sugar levels. 
This one is also extraordinarily sweet. It's 600 times sweeter than sucrose. So if this isn't enough, let me tell you a little bit more about why I hate artificial sweeteners. Although they're developed as a sugar substitute to help reduce insulin resistance and obesity, data in both animal models and humans suggests that the effects of these sweeteners contribute to metabolic syndrome and the obesity epidemic. They appear to change the microbiome, lead to decreased satiety, which we're gonna go into in a minute, alter glucose homeostasis, and are associated with increased caloric consumption and weight gain. Not just because of the bartering that I had a Diet Coke, so now I can have a cookie, but because they change your palate. Um, Artificial sweeteners are marketed as a healthy alternative to sugar and a tool for weight loss, but the data shows that intended effects do not correlate with what is being seen in clinical practice. Future research should focus on the newer plant-based sweeteners, like monk fruit and, and that kind of thing, incorporated extended study durations to, to look at the long-term effects of artificial sweetener consumption and focus on changes in the microbiome, as it seems to be one of the main driving forces between nutrient absorption and glucose metabolism. Further, like sugars, intense sweeteners stimulate the sweet taste receptors. So we know that we have five different taste receptors in our mouth, right? We have sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami, or savory. But we also have taste receptors all through the gut. And some of those taste receptors are the bitter taste receptors. The sugar receptors, the sweet, will overlap and stimulate the bitter receptors and vice versa. So when you eat massive amounts of sugar, you're stimulating and changing your satiety reflexes by messing with your bitter taste receptors in your colon and all through your digestive system. So these receptors are expressed in multiple different places, and they're involved in the modulation of appetite, glucose homeostasis, and gut motility. So the taste genotypes resulting in functional receptor changes and altered receptor expression levels can be associated with metabolic conditions. The number one source of added sugar in our diet is the soft drinks, and that both a, an altered gut microbiome and artificial sweeteners change the oral receptor taste expression levels. So when you choose diet over regular and you combine that with foods that are fertilizing the wrong kind of bacterial growth in your gut, you're literally setting yourself up to be sick. So this is an area that I'm particularly interested in. why every dietitian and every article that you've ever read says, please, eat lots of green and leafy vegetables because they're full of bitter um, casings. These receptors are expressed throughout the gut with location-dependent roles. In the oral cavity, they're involved in the conscious perception of bitter casings, while in the lower GI tract, they have roles in chemoreception and regulation of GI function. And through these diverse roles, the receptors can be involved in modulating appetite and diet with consequences regulation of the system. And interestingly, the largest concentration of where those green leafy vegetables should be going, those bitter tasting is in the colon, right? So we are literally designed to help our bodies feed our microbiome by eating lots and lots of foods that can't be broken down in the small bowel and built into the cell. Okay. All right. But we can't even blame all of this um, adipogenesis and obesity issues on just eating sweet things or artificial sweeteners because the artificial sweeteners stimulate adipogenesis and suppress lipolysis independent of the sweet taste receptors, which are also, by the way, present on adipocytes. So while I recognize that the dietary recommendations in this country still say um, to substitute artificial sweeteners for diabetics and people with metabolic dysregulation, artificial sweeteners really seem to be contributing to the very problems that they are purported to help with. So here's a little bit more data to back that up. Um, artificial sweeteners encourage bartering with calories. Like I said before, I, you know, I had a diet soda so I can have a cookie. Um, they, because they're so intensely sweet, they make less intense foods like fruit um, or carrots less appealing. And by extension, they make better, bitter foods like vegetables almost unpalatable. Um, they dissociate caloric intake from the sweet flavor, which is something that, uh, that messes with the enteric nervous system. And there are multiple studies that show a high rate of addiction, even over um, highly addictive substances like cocaine. Take a look at that. Rats kick saccharin over cocaine. 
in not just one study, but multiple studies. Um, and finally, dietary drinks are associated with significant increases in metabolic syndrome and uh, diabetes. So I totally get it that I'm on a little bit of a soapbox here, but I really want you guys to understand and, and kind of evaluate your choices, um, not only for your own health, but also for that of your patients. So in conclusion, the food that you put in your mouth feeds your microbiome, which in turn feeds you, feeds your enterocytes. Your microbiome loves to eat fiber, and it loves to get supported by uh, other probiotic and fermented foods. There's a broad scope of food and diet choices that are in alignment with healthy eating patterns, including intermittent fasting. And the literature is becoming stronger and stronger on artificial sweeteners, so please take that into consideration with, when counseling your patients and also with what you're pulling out of the doctor's lounge. So today, I've, I hope I've kind of shown you the, the critical nature between what you put in your body over your lunch as you're sitting here eating, and I hope I haven't guilted you too much. <laughs> um, but diets that are rich in, in fiber and, and fermented foods are really what I would like for you to, to kind of take away from this. I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> yes, ma'am. There's really a lot of interesting literature on chronobiology um, and the natural eating patterns that are linked with not only our melatonin but also our cortisol drive coming in first thing in the morning. So I think a seven to seven fast is a pretty reasonable amount of time. If people want to push that, it seems to work a little bit better to um, stop eating earlier in the day. So a 7 a.m. to a 5 p.m. or even to a 4 p.m. works a little bit better than waiting to eat your first meal until 11 o'clock in the morning. Welcome. Yes, sir. So uh, being in primary care, one of the uh, things we have is time pressure. You gave a wonderful lecture for, for an hour. I have a few minutes to tell patients about a healthy diet. Um, what resources are out there on the Internet? What would you consider something that is uh, – uh, reliable as far as uh, a, a resource on the internet, on YouTube, things like that. Second question is uh, all of us here basically work on an inpatient setting. We see the diets that put, get put in front of people here in the hospital. Should we be fine tuning the diet to the condition that they're in and how much leeway do we have? I mean, we can't ex order exactly the, the right kind of food for people. They may not have those preferences at the moment. A lot of people with C. diff, for example, who probably need a high-fiber diet, don't want to eat at all because they know every time they eat they'll, they'll get diarrhea. But how do we modify the diet to even on an inpatient setting? So for Zoom, um, this the first question is what are the online resources that are available for a busy practitioner who only has a few moments to counsel their patients in the office? And I think just asking them to Google a Mediterranean diet or any of the Mediterranean diet-based other diets. So anybody who has a family history of um, dementia or Alzheimer's or, or anything along those lines, I always recommend the MIND diet to them, M-I-N-D. It's an acronym, and I can never remember what it stands for. It's quite complicated. Um, so that, that's what I tell people to look for. And there are thousands of books on Amazon. Um, I have that food pyramid, that slide photocopied, and that's what I give my patients because it at least gives them something um, to, to go home with immediately. Um, and then the next question was, hospital food is crappy, and how do we help our patients to make better choices in the hospital and support them while they're getting hospital care, to paraphrase, yeah? So that's a really tough question, because the hospitals are under financial pressure to create the most amount of food with the least amount of, um, of components and the least amount of employees. And chopping things takes much longer than pouring a box into some boiling water and covering it with a powder and putting that on a tray, right? Um, so we have regular conversations with, or we were in the process of having regular conversations with our hospitals before everybody was distracted by COVID. Um, and we're going to be going back to that uh, just in terms of some basic food substitutions. Um, I think frozen food as opposed to fresh, then you can get frozen food that is already chopped up. And so that cuts back on overall cost. It cuts back on waste. They only use what they need, uh, you know, for that particular day. And things, most of the vegetables are frozen basically on site. 
So in some situations, especially when you're traveling to a small town or whatever, they're actually fresher to get frozen fruits and vegetables than they are if you buy them out of the produce section of the grocery store. So I think that's one good food substitution trick. Um, another is in people that have C. diff, eating a high concentration of probiotic foods will help to, I mean, you're really kind of targeting the luminal colonization of the digestive tract at that point, but you're trying to get a little bit of those, you know, those edges uh, to, to recolonize. So um, I think kefir is a great choice because it's a liquid already. And so they can tolerate that a little bit more um, than some of the other, you know, than, than eating a salad uh, when you're talking about a C. diff patient. And um, I think, you know, yogurts and, and pickles and things like that, you can even drink the pickle juice. You don't necessarily have to eat the pickle. Um, I know a lot of people that run um, long distances drink pickle juice afterwards for, for multiple reasons. So those would be my two suggestions. Great. Thank you. Yes. And then you had a question? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just have another question. I feel like I have a couple clinic patients where um, I, like, I'll like i maybe suggest a Mediterranean diet or suggest some diet, and they, they seem to initially be okay with it, but then their big thing is, like, they'll wake up at 3 in the morning and eat, like, a whole quart of ice cream. Or they'll wake up, like, they have, like, a, everyone seems to have, like, this, like, sweet tooth for, like, some sort of, like, food that, like, really seems to set them back. So they, like, yeah. incorporate this. And I know there's, like, some research out there of, like, oh, like, Is there any, um, do you have any strategies for that to sort of curtail um, those, I guess, I guess that issue that comes up? Yes. So this problem is a cortisol problem. This, this starving at 2 o'clock in the morning thing is a problem with cortisol secretion. Remember what cortisol does in your body, right? It steals your protein away from your muscles. It raises your blood sugar levels. It's your stress hormone, et cetera, et cetera. So we're supposed to have a spike of our cortisol levels starting to rise around 4 o'clock in the morning to help kickstart us and, and help us get out of bed in the morning, yeah? And melatonin and, and cortisol are inversely related. So when cortisol goes up, when you feel more stressed, you can't sleep. Your pineal gland doesn't secrete as much melatonin. And especially if, you've, if you're stressed over the course of your day and you don't have time to process all of those stressors, you start getting a second cortisol spike around 10 o'clock at night. So then you lay down, you're exhausted, all you can do is think about going to sleep, and your brain is like, right? So the key to fixing that food problem is actually stress reduction. So exercise, mindfulness, meditation, eating mindfully, etc. If people are waking up in the night, I usually prescribe them some valerian root as opposed to melatonin because melatonin will make people feel a little bit too drugged if you're taking it again at 3 or 4 in the morning. Um, but an extended release or a sustained release melatonin of between 1 and 3 milligrams two hours before bedtime will also help to overcome that. And the final piece of that is you have to sometimes just suffer through for two nights. If you don't eat at 3 o'clock in the morning, your body very quickly doesn't like waste. And so it's not going to make all those digestive enzymes. Your hydrochloric acid is not going to start going up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You're not going to feel hungry. You're not going to be stimulated. So you have to just ignore it for two days. And after two days, your body gets that message and stops making all those otherwise wasted enzymes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I have a few questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the question was, is there a, a cross-relationship between allergic diseases, hyperimmune responses, and the microbiome and people's uh, food choices? And I would say that, yes, that's absolutely coming out. A lot of the integrative medicine literature is very, very focused on that. Um, even the functional medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy, everybody talks about the gut first. And so the food choices that we make having an impact on everything else that's happening in terms of health. Um, in Chinese medicine, which is about 3,500 years old, the lung, the immune system, the skin, the nose, and the large intestine are all part of one five-element component. And so quite literally, the, the two organs that are at the um, extremes in terms of defining what is self versus non-self, right? If a pathogen invades from above, the first place it goes to the lungs, 
and we kick it out by coughing and sneezing. And the microbiome, we understand, is very, very intrinsically important to our overall immune health. My dermatology colleagues are even giving people probiotics for their acne now. So I would say from every form of the components of integrative medicine, as well as the crosstalk between allopathic and non-allopathic medicine, that point is absolutely true. We have a few questions on Zoom. Okay. Um, first question is, can you please comment on stevia? It was initially thought to be a, a plant-based sweetener, and, but it also can be similar to artificial sweeteners. Um, do you have thoughts on stevia? And I guess in line with that, also agave as a, a natural sweetener? Yeah. So stevia is a leafy plant. It looks a little bit like parsley. And so if you're cooking with, you know, making a spaghetti sauce or something like that, and you need a little bit of a sweetener to go along with that, then stevia is always what I pick. It also is very nice in tea. Um, you can eat the stevia leaves, and they're not nearly as, um, they don't have those yucky aftertastes that a lot of the artificial sweeteners have as well. Um, when it is processed out of its leaf form, then we're dealing with more chemicals and we're dealing with, with kind of more problems overall. So I haven't seen a lot of literature saying that that one is as bad as some of the others or is as problematic as some of the others, uh, but it is one to definitely keep an eye on. And then agave and monk fruit, those are, those are better choices than I, I think the artificial sweeteners, although the absolute best choice is to just kind of not eat uh, processed foods as much as possible. Next question. With regard to intermittent fasting, what's the longest time for an extended fast that's considered safe for a healthy individual? I have not seen any literature on that specifically uh, because it's going to vary widely with people's thyroids and, you know, all of the other kind of components that go into metabolism, how active they are over the course of the day, how much they're exercising. So I think in terms of an individual I would not recommend anybody fast for more than 16 hours a day, and I think even that is really pushing it. But to my knowledge, there's not any literature that has come out and said, okay, this is the cutoff between what is safe and not safe. How about any extended fast, like two, three-day fast? You know, there's these fads with uh, cleansing or water, water diets for a couple of days and then resuming. Can you, do you have any comment on those? So I think for most people, doing something that is, cleanse is such a charged word, right? Because I'm talking to a, a group of doctors, and cleanse can mean such a wide variety of things. So if someone is doing colon hydrotherapy and is not drinking anything but water um, and is exercising vigorously, that's not going to be good right? That, that's not going to be helpful. And it's not going to actually be doing what the person is trying to do, which is to put themselves in parasympathetic mode and allow rest and digest to happen and clean out their, their gut. It's going to put them in a panic mode, right? We're going to be activating the sympathetic nervous system and getting the cortisol spikes and all that kind of thing. So that is not helpful. Something where people are eating I don't like juicing as opposed to putting things in a blender and grinding them up because if you juice, then you lose all of the prebiotic components that are in the fruits and vegetables and you're just getting the sugar spikes, which raises your blood sugar level. So it's the fiber that allows the blood sugar to be absorbed slowly over time and helps you from having these big spikes. So putting things in a blender and eating a bunch of blended you know, V8 is a completely different situation than eating a lot of apple juice and doing that over the course of three days. So cleanse is, is one of those terms that you have to kind of really drill down on and figure out what exactly people are talking about. Great, and in, in line with, um, with intermittent fasting, is there any data um, or, or do you have any comment on specifically skipping breakfast? Is that natural uh, or is there any health benefit to specifically skipping breakfast as opposed to other meals or time-restricted eating? If you're going to look at the chronobiology literature, 
then the breakfast should be the biggest meal of the day. Lunch should be a slightly smaller meal of the day. And if you're going to skip anything, then you skip dinner. We do it exactly the opposite in this country. Most of us have a cup of coffee for breakfast and maybe a little nosh in the surgeon's lounge or the doctor's lounge. And then we have a little something for lunch. And then we're starving by the time 6 o'clock rolls around and we have a snack while we're making our dinner. And then we have more food after that. So that can't possibly be helpful, right? If you just think about your metabolism over the course of the day, we're starving ourselves when we're in our most active metabolic mode, and then we're feeding ourselves right before we go into low metabolic mode. So um, in Chinese medicine, the, the gut is most active first thing in the morning, between 7 o'clock in the morning and 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, that's the time when we should be eating the, the largest amount of food. So I would say from the chronobiology literature and also from a lot of these ancient forms of medicine that have been around for thousands of years, eat your breakfast. Any other questions or comments? I have one last question personally myself. Um, I think it's a very interesting topic and is a huge void in medical education. You know, I think general public goes to doctors to try and get, um, you know, counseling on how to live healthier, yet we aren't educated whatsoever on nutrition um, in medical school or, you know, even in residency. Um, so I think it's a really important topic. Um, tying into kind of what Tommy was talking about in terms of counseling patients, it's already difficult. And when we do have the time and we find the time to counsel the patients in the office on on diet. Um, one thing that I, I've seen a lot of patients struggle with is implementation. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really wishing and hopeful that our medical system is going to become, our insurance system is going to become more quality driven rather than quantity driven in terms of reimbursement. But do you know of any clinic or system that is, is doing things like teaching people, teaching patients how to shop, how to read food labels, going to the store with them, doing nutritional therapy, just like we prescribe physical therapy for someone. Can we take them into the kitchen, teach them how to cook so that they can actually use these skills that we're trying to teach them in the office? Thanks, Chad. I will slip you the 20 bucks later. <laughs> that is the importance of culinary medicine, right? Culinary medicine sits at the juxtaposition between how does your body respond to food? You know, what, what is nutrition? And then how to cook and prepare food. Because people, we don't have home ec in, college or in high school anymore. And so people don't come away with even knowing how to chop an onion. Um, so culinary medicine teaches meal planning. And, you know, there's a lot of studies actually that look at when physicians spend the time to talk to their patients, their patients have better longevity and their overall um, outcomes improve. So, so culinary medicine is that thing. Um, and right now I use a lot of dietitians. I refer to patients to dietitians, especially when I want to talk to them about food substitutions. We do tons of talks and lectures in the medical school about meal planning. Um, I have probably 70 handouts that I used at one point or another to my patients that I created in my private practice before I went back into academia. So one of them is a five-page sheet on all kinds of breakfast um, recipes. And I'd be happy to email that to you so you can disseminate it not only for yourselves um, as clinicians, but also for your patients. Um, some, my favorite one, my favorite go-to is what I refer to as an egg pie. It's not a quiche because it's not full of all kinds of cream and, and things like that. And it's not a frittata because potatoes are not so great for people that have sugar problems. So you saute a bunch of vegetables, you put them in a pie pan, you cover it with beaten egg, and you bake it at 365 for 35 minutes. And then you have a wedge of protein and vegetables ready to walk out the door in your hand in the morning. It couldn't be easier. And you do that on whatever day off you have on the weekend. You can use the rest of whatever is left over from your stir fry that you had earlier in the week. You can grab a bunch of mixed frozen vegetables and pop it in there on the weekend. It takes literally five minutes to put this together. And you have eight slices of breakfast ready and or a healthy lunch or a snack. I honestly used to make these and when I was a surgery resident, stick one in my pocket. Like I had a little plastic baggie and I had, you know, cooked egg and vegetables ready for a between-cases snack so that I wasn't tempted 
by eating whatever was in the doctor's lounge. So I think we really have to help our patients with the menu planning and the skills of shopping as well as the food preparation over the course of the week. Um, if I can elaborate for just one more second. The other thing I love is crock pots because you chop up all the vegetables and everything at night, you put that component in the refrigerator, you wake up just five minutes earlier, you dump it in the crock pot and you come home and somebody has made you dinner. And then you have aliquots that you can freeze, right? And you can eat later on in the week or you can have foods ready for whenever your night float or, or whatever it is you're dealing with. So crock pots and egg pie are two of my favorite things to recommend to patients that make it logistically easy for them to, to accomplish healthy choices. And if you don't mind, there's one last question on Zoom. Um, kind of tying into um, that response, uh, you know, there's growing literature on uh, not only li lifespan, but health span. Um, and there's been some work done, I think, by some government agencies looking at medications that can in, improve health span. And the metformin is thought to be one that can improve your, your lifespan, even in non-diabetics. Do you have any comment on, on that? I realize I'm talking to a room full of internal medicine doctors. And no, I don't. I have, I have started to see some of that literature come out, but I don't think I have read enough about it to be able to make an intelligent comment about it. Um, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. Also, as somebody who doesn't regularly prescribe metformin. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, well thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I brought food. So I made this really quick quinoa salad chopped up a bunch of fruits and vegetables, put in a little vinegar and oil and some seasonings, and we're going to mix that up, and I'll be serving that in the doctor's lounge. So come and sample. <laughs>